four corners of the earth and the far corridors of history. Dateline, World War II. Thirty-one July, 1942, the South Pacific. After gathering just south of the Fiji Islands, an American naval task force under the command of Vice Admiral Frank Fletcher set sail for the Solomon Islands. The operation, dubbed Watchtower, marks the beginning of what promises to be a long and bloody struggle to drive the Japanese from their chain of Pacific Island bases. The stunning defeat of the Japanese fleet at Midway marked, for both sides, a decisive turning point in the course of the war. For the Japanese, it was a rude awakening. They were, for the first time, forced to swallow the bitter pill of defeat and accept the fact that further expansion to the south and west would no longer be possible. For the Americans, it was a desperately needed victory. It bolstered the spirit of the public and created a crack in the Japanese defenses, which the Allies are now attempting to exploit. The Solomons, located in the torrid latitudes just south of the equator, offer the Americans two vital bases. A deep water seaport at the island of Tulagi and, perhaps more important, a partially completed airfield on the island of Guadalcanal. The importance of these facilities is not lost to either side. For the Japanese, they offer a forward base from which their naval and air forces can impede the flow of men and material pouring across the South Pacific to Australia. For the Allies, taking the port and airfield will not only help secure the supply routes, but will also provide a platform for launching far-reaching offensive operations against the Japanese. Under cover of heavy weather, Fletcher's task force is able to approach their objective undetected by the Japanese. The men of the 1st Marine Division, under the command of Major General Alexander Vandegrift, prepare for what will be the first true test of American land forces in this war. In the pre-dawn hours of 7 August, naval guns and carrier-based aircraft begin pounding Japanese positions on Tulagi and Guadalcanal. Australian coast watchers in the hills on Guadalcanal direct the fire, which is extremely effective. The Australians are amazed at the accuracy of the Navy's big guns, watching as one by one Japanese positions vanish in clouds of fire and flying debris. As the Marines head for the beaches on both Tulagi and Guadalcanal, there is no response from the Japanese on the islands. The men in the assault boats share a cautious optimism. Reaching the beach, it seems as if the bombardment has driven the Japanese off the island. The Marines land completely unopposed, and as they move inland to the partially completed airfield at Lunga Point, it's quite clear that the Japanese pulled out in a hurry. Equipment, ammunition, and rations are abandoned everywhere. While Marines secure the airfield, logistical problems are mounting on the beach. Material is coming off ships faster than it can be moved to inland cover. American commanders, fearing that an attack by Japanese bombers could easily destroy the vital supplies, slow the flow of material coming in. This gives the men on the island time to move the existing supplies inland, but reduces the total amount of supplies available. By late in the afternoon of 7 August, the Marines on Tulagi make contact with the Japanese. An enemy garrison holed up in the caves on the eastern end of the tiny island begins showering the Marines with heavy machine gun fire. The Marines are stunned by the Japanese unwillingness to surrender in the face of such an overwhelming force. They are forced to destroy the Japanese positions one by one. Of the 2,000 defenders on the island, 23 are taken prisoner. Meanwhile, on Guadalcanal, the unloading of supplies has been interrupted by a flight of twin-engine Japanese bombers. Anti-aircraft batteries and Navy fighters quickly down seven of the attackers and force the rest to flee. But the attacks continue off and on through the afternoon of the 8th. While they do little damage, 
They cause serious delays in the unloading of equipment and supplies. By late afternoon on the 8th, Admiral Fletcher believes he can no longer keep his ships anchored off Guadalcanal. He is certain that the Japanese fleet must be steaming toward him. Fuel reserves for his fighters are dangerously low, threatening to leave the critical flat tops defenseless. He orders the carriers to steam out of the area, leaving the amphibious force without air cover. Without the protection of the fleet air wing, Admiral Richmond Turner informs Vandegrift that he will have to withdraw his cruisers and transports to prevent losing them to the Japanese bombers. Vandegrift is furious. If the amphibious support ships leave, his marines will be stranded on these jungle islands with only a portion of their supplies. Near midnight, as the two commanders feud, a Japanese naval force of seven cruisers and one destroyer slips past American pickets near Savo Island, 10 miles off the coast of Guadalcanal. Catching Turner's force completely off guard, the Japanese hit the Allies with torpedoes and gunfire. In a matter of moments, an Australian and three American cruisers are turned into burning masses of twisted steel and begin sinking to the bottom. The Japanese commander, elated with his success, but fearful that Fletcher's carriers would be launching a retaliatory airstrike, decides to retire to Rabaul. By doing that, the Japanese miss their chance to sink the transport and supply ship sitting defenseless off the coast of Guadalcanal. After this humiliating defeat, Turner orders what is left of his force to leave the area. He takes with him tons of supplies, rations, barbed wire, field artillery pieces, and the equipment the Marines need to complete the airfield. 1,000 Marine reserves are also on the ships as they turn and sail off. The 6,000 Marines on Tulagi and the 10,000 on Guadalcanal are left completely isolated. All they can do now is prepare for an attack that they know will come. The men dig their defensive positions, working feverishly to complete the airfield with the little equipment at their disposal. They know the airfield is the key. Air cover will be critical if they are to survive until they can be resupplied and reinforced. As the Marines prepare for the fight to come, Allied military commanders hold their breath. Success on Guadalcanal, they know would only be the first step in the long trek across the Pacific. But failure would be a devastating blow to the Allied cause. If the Japanese can stop the flow of men and materiel to Australia, the war in the Pacific may be lost. Twenty-four August 1942, Stalingrad. As the sun rises, a pall of smoke hangs over the city and along with it, the threat of German conquest. Having been attacked almost non-stop for the last 24 hours by a seemingly endless stream of Luftwaffe bombers and fighter bombers, Stalingrad is a sea of flames and the rising sun brings no respite as German bombs continue to fall. These air raids, are the prologue of a planned ground assault which Nazi commanders fully expect will drive the Red Army from this military and psychological stronghold on the Volga River. Just north of the city, Army Group B, under the command of General Friedrich von Paulus, stands poised, having halted briefly to allow the Luftwaffe to soften up the Russian defenses. But with Hitler having decreed that Stalingrad must fall by the 25th, there is little time to waste. With the bombs still falling on the city center, German armor begins its push toward the northern suburb of Renock. As they advance, the Panzers find themselves engaging divisions which exist primarily on paper and in the wishful thoughts of Stalin and his commanders. They are, by and large, newly recruited, poorly trained, and ill-equipped. Nazi tanks make quick work of the outer defensive lines. By 25 August, the day Hitler had expected to announce the fall of Stalingrad, the Red Army is able to regroup and counterattack, driving the Wehrmacht troops back nearly to the shores of the Volga. The victory is short-lived, however, and by 1st September, the Nazis have not only turned back the counteroffensive, they have pushed deep into Stalingrad. 
The beginning of the month finds the fate of Stalingrad resting squarely on the shoulders of the newly appointed Deputy Commander-in-Chief, Georgi Zhukov. Having been elevated to his new position on 27 August, he is now second only to Stalin himself in the chain of command. And the Russian leader has made it clear to Zhukov that his immediate task is to keep Stalin's namesake city from falling to the Nazis. On 3 September, Zhukov orders an attack against German supply routes north of the city near the Volga, intended to stem the flow of Nazi troops and equipment across the river the offensive grinds to a halt when Red Army troops run out of ammunition. Under direct orders from Stalin, Zhukov again takes up the battle on 5 September. The Russians fight ferociously, but the Germans are too well entrenched. By the 10th, Zhukov reports to Stalin that the effort has been for naught and that Stalingrad may be lost. But even as the message reaches Moscow, the German advance into Stalingrad has begun to slow. And it is the city itself, rather than its defenders, that is impeding the Nazi troops. Aggressive bombing by the Luftwaffe, along with the fierce combat, have filled the streets with rubble, making passage by panzers difficult at best. As a result, most of the fighting must be done by infantry, moving slowly from street to street. The further they progress, the harder they are forced to fight for every foot they take. On 12 September, command of the Russian 62nd Army is taken over by a top, lean general by the name of Vasily Ivanovich Tvikov. And almost immediately, the Germans' task becomes even more difficult. Declaring to Stalin and to his men, we shall either hold the city or die there, Tvikov turns his army into a band of urban guerrillas, urging them to conceal themselves in basements and bombed out buildings. He makes it clear that retreat is not an option and cowardice will be punished by death. It is not long before his men begin to refer to him as general stubbornness. Still, despite the slowdown, the German advance continues. By 16 September, the Russians hold only a sliver of the city and are down to their final cohesive line of defense, which is anchored by a huge grain elevator. From their positions in the elevator, the Red Army troops are able to pin down an entire Wehrmacht battalion and stall the German advance for six days. Yet, in spite of the heroic efforts of Tchuikov's men, by 22 September, the defensive line crumbles. As it does, the men of the 62nd fall back into the smoke and rubble of the city, assembling into small groups, concealing themselves in the ruins of Stalingrad, preparing to hold out at all costs. And so it is that nearly a month after Adolf Hitler had declared that Stalingrad would become his latest conquest, the Wehrmacht seemingly stands poised to deliver the prize to their leader. Nineteen August, nineteen forty two, the English Channel. An armada of 253 ships set sail for the coast of France. This marks the beginning of Operation Jubilee, a commando raid on the German-held port of Dieppe. Comprised primarily of Canadian troops, the operation has several goals. First, to help appease Russian dictator Joseph Stalin, who is demanding a second European front. Second, to satisfy the Canadians who have been itching to get into the fight. And third, to destroy vital dock facilities, as well as food, ammunition, and fuel stores. The hastily planned operation runs into trouble early. German trawlers spot the force and send up signal flares alerting the defenders of Dieppe. German e-boats attack the landing craft as they make their way to shore, killing many of the men before they ever set foot on land. Upon reaching the beach, things continue to get worse. The landing area is surrounded by a high bluff concealing German artillery and machine gun positions. It is for the Germans a virtual shooting gallery. The Canadians try desperately to drive inland, advancing into a hail of machine gun and mortar fire. The landscape is covered with dead and wounded men and smashed equipment. After nine hours of desperate fighting, it is apparent to both sides that Operation Jubilee is an unmitigated disaster. The order is given for the men to retreat to the ships. For 
many, however, it is too late. Over 1,000 men are dead, and 2,500 are taken prisoner. For the Allies, Operation Jubilee is a hard lesson learned. Any future assault against German coastal defenses must be preceded by massive naval and aerial bombardment, and more important, must be one of overwhelming force. For now, all the Allies can do is retreat to Britain to lick their wounds and wait for another chance at cracking fortress Europe. They are peas in a pod. Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini. Twin dictators who rode the same tide of European discontent to total control of their respective nations, they now threaten both their own people and the outside world in a way that is almost unparalleled in history. Hitler, of course, is well known, but Italian Premier Mussolini, very much the junior partner in the European axis, is less familiar. In many ways, however, it was Mussolini who paved the way for Hitler, who showed the Nazi tyrant the path from obscurity to power. Mussolini, like Hitler, was a veteran of World War I who returned to a nation descending into chaos. Unlike the Germans, the Italians were not a defeated nation. But throughout Europe, historic tides were building. The Great Depression, which didn't strike the United States until the 1930s, crippled Europe in the early 1920s. The elite running the continent showed little concern for the plight of the unemployed and starving. From the East, Marxism and its descendant communism promised the increasingly disgruntled masses a kind of paradise where employment was total and want was nothing to fear. Mussolini watched the onset of anarchy as a newspaper writer and editor. Gaining a reputation as a firebrand and enemy of the established order, he was chased out of Austria for his rabble-rousing, and upon landing in his native Italy, quickly thrust himself into the emerging movement of veterans disgruntled with the status quo. In 1919, he created the Fascist Party, ran unsuccessfully for Parliament later that year, and, like Hitler, was implicated in a plot to overthrow his country's government. Unlike Hitler, who served jail time for his treason, Mussolini was spared incarceration. The fascists continued to organize and agitate, and in only three years, Mussolini went from disgrace to the Italian premier's office. Christened by his followers, Il Duce, the leader, he watched with great interest as Hitler seized control of Germany in 1933. One of the Fuhrer's first acts was to arrange a meeting with Il Duce. The two dictators met in Venice in June 1934 and took an almost instant dislike to each other. Hitler was ill at ease in the unfamiliar role of head of state and interpreted Mussolini's preoccupation with grand ceremonial flourishes as a snub. In 1935, spurring the Italian people on with reminders of Rome's lost empire, Mussolini invaded Ethiopia. His legions, armed with machine guns and artillery, easily defeated the Ethiopians, fighting largely with weapons that would have been familiar to Julius Caesar. Despite their initial differences, the dictator's mutual interests drew Hitler and Mussolini together. In 1936, they cooperated to provide arms and advisors to aspiring Spanish dictator Francisco Franco. The relationship between the dictators cemented in 1937. Mussolini visited Hitler in Berlin, and for five days they romped around Nazi Germany, observing combat maneuvers and parades of goose-stepping soldiers. Hitler took Austria a year later, and Mussolini Virtually alone among European leaders did not complain. He acquiesced to Hitler's absorption of Czechoslovakia, protested only mildly when the Germans invaded Poland, and when the Nazis invaded France, Mussolini's only reaction was to join in the plunder. They are peas in a pod, Hitler and Mussolini. Twin dictators challenging the world to come stop them. They are only now receiving the world's answer. Thank you.